you're bound to run into this at some point, so let's talk about closures in Rust. My name is Ricky. Welcome to The Dev Method. So if you like what you're seeing, we have a subscribe button down at the bottom. You can go ahead and click on that, or do a thumbs up if you really like this and share it with a friend. You can also follow me on Twitter at The Dev Method. I'll be posting when I have new videos there, so if you want to follow along, go ahead. So closures, let's talk about them. You're going to run into this when you work with some of the APIs that come out of the built-in libraries for Rust. Closures are anonymous functions that you're going to be able to save to some variable, and you can also pass them in as arguments to another function. The key thing about the closures is not necessarily the implementation that's inside, but the values that it captures from its environment. So let's take a look at our first example. So we have some shirts. We want to put them in the inventory and we're gonna give away shirts. That's kind of the idea. So we have a enum of shirts. We have a red and blue shirt, and then we have our inventory, and then we have our giveaway right here. Now, um, if we go to main, you'll see that we create this inventory as a store, and then we're gonna create two giveaways, and then uh, that's kind of it. That's the idea. Now, we don't need to really know about this program and actually what it does, but we want to look at the syntax or at least start looking at how we're going to use some closures in Rust. So if you look with me here on line 13, you'll see this uh, unwrap or else. So we might have talked about this in previous videos, uh, but essentially it's going to say like, okay, whatever this thing is, it's an option. So it might be there, it might not be there. So we have this handy dandy. Uh, function here where it says unwrap this, but if you can't, if there's nothing there, then execute what's in this closure and give me that returned value. Now, in this case, it's saying self most stocked. So that's referring to this method here on inventory. So uh, if we can't find anything, if we don't give any user preference here of a shirt color, then we're going to say, all right, call this just the one time and then return that as the value to this function of giveaway. So that's the idea. So notice here we have these little pipes here, and then there's just a space and then just a one-liner of code. So let's look at the syntax, or at least start to break down the syntax of these closures. So here we are assigning a closure to a variable, and that variable is called expensive underscore closure. And then here we have the first argument and the only argument to this closure, and then we have here return. So we have this dash and then greater than sign. Kind of looks like an arrow pointing to the right. And then that's the return type there. So we have num as being the argument value or the parameter value. And then there's colon space with the type of that parameter. So that's how that works. And then this is the code that would run inside. And of course, just returning just like a function from before, uh, we're returning num. So that's the idea. Now here I have on line 70, I have add one. This is the first version of it. And this is just a regular function. And I've spaced out the characters and the syntax just so you can see how these all line up. And uh, we have here parentheses, right? So this is like review from before. Parentheses and then the parameter and then this little arrow looking thing to the return type. And then you have the body of that function. And then notice that that function does not end with a semicolon because it's just a function. So the closure, very similar to the one we just did before, we have here x as the parameter, and then the return type, and then we execute the body there. Another way to write the same thing would just be to leave out that uh, type, because it maybe could be inferred. And then you have x plus 1 here. Um, and then there's even a an example here where you can leave out the, uh, the wing braces there. But let's actually run this in that main of that previous application we were looking at, just so you can see what some of the issues might actually be. All right, so we'll do cargo build. All right, so I was expecting an error, so let's take a look and see what that is. All right, here it is. So consider giving this closure a type. So that's saying, okay, do the thing that is up above because it doesn't really know from its context of how it's being used, so it can't really infer the type. We'll see this a couple times in our examples. So I build again, and again, and again, it just wants me to 
be explicit about the type. So here we are, build, and then we're good. Good to go. So now let's take a look at an example where it does infer the argument type for that closure. So here we have example closure, and all it does is take x and return it. But we don't even know what it is. So if you'd see here on line 66, we have here us calling the closure. And within this uh, line of code, or the, like this scope, you might think of it that way, uh, we know that it was declared, not really with a type. However, the compiler goes a little step further and looks for its first usage, and it can infer that x is actually supposed to be a string. Once it knows that, any of the execution that we have afterward of that closure, so if we run the closure here on line 69, then we're trying to use a different type, so that's not going to work. It's always going to want it to be a string. So if we were to run that code, we'd actually get this error here. So it's saying, like, trying to use conversion method to string, right? So it's saying maybe that's what we want to actually write instead, because it expected a string, but it found some form of an integer. So now let's take it a step further. There are three things we can think about when we're using our environment with a closure. We can either capture references or take ownership. So with capturing, we can either do borrowing with immutability, or we could do borrowing with mutability, or the last one, we could just take ownership. So here's our example of borrowing with immutability. So we have here our list on line 14. It's a vector of integers. Uh, we go ahead and print it, OK? And then we have our local variable of the closure, which is only borrows. So only borrows actually borrows the list to then just print it out. Now, the fact that we don't modify that list means that it's, it's not mutable. We also didn't mark this as mute either, so we wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, line 20 is going to print out just fine. And then we're going to call the function. And then also, same thing here. Uh, we're just going to print out the list. So this actually works totally fine. I'm going to run the code so you can actually see that. So here it is, runs before defining, before calling the closure, from the closure itself, and then after the closure. So that's a pretty straightforward use case. Now let's talk about borrowing mutably. So here we have that same list that we had before, but now we're marking it as a mutable list. Um, and now our borrow closure that we're creating here is borrows mutably. And uh, takes no parameters, but then um, it actually pushes something onto the list. Now, this is the line that was there before. It's going to cause an error. So before calling the closure, if we want to then use the list, we won't be able to do that because it's already been borrowed on line 18 in there in that closure. Because we're then going to call the closure. So you can imagine we would expect list to be anything of the values that it was created with here. But we do have this like mutable closure here. Um, so the contents actually might change. So let's run the code and let's see the error. All right, so here it is. It is saying line uh, 20, immutable borrow, right? So first borrow occurs here due to list in the closure. It's a mutable borrow. Compiler is pretty smart, so it's really guiding us, telling us what it's doing. And then here's the mutable borrow later used here. So it was able to see all this. So that's pretty cool. So the way to fix this is don't use the list, but then uh, just use the closure from then on out. Um, and then after you're done using the closure, you can then call list again if you want. So let's run this version of the code and see what the output actually is. All right, so you can see here, um, before it goes into the closure, it's one, two, three. And then after calling the closure, because it's a borrowing reference, uh, it already mutated the value, so now the value has changed. So now here's our example where um, we want to actually be taking ownership. So this example here, imagine we have uh, two separate threads. We have like the main function, that thread that it's running on, and then we have just some other thread, thread that we're going to go ahead and create. And we don't know when we actually spawn a thread and run code on it. We don't know if the main thread that we're in currently will finish first, or if that new spawn thread will finish first either. That's kind of up to the operating system. And it's just, it's, it's not determinate. So here we have our list. And it's uh, line 16. And then we print out the list. 
Then we create the thread, and we're running the thread. This is how we do that in Rust. We have to do, uh, from the standard library, get thread, do the spawn, put a closure in there. In this case, we're not assigning it to a, a variable. We're just go ahead and putting it in line. Um, now we're actually moving. So it's saying take any of the captured values, so in this case it's just list, and take their ownership and move them into this thread. That means we will not be able to use thread after, or this means we will not be able to use list afterwards. That's what line 22 is having an issue with here. So let's go ahead and run this and let's just see what happens and then we'll correct the problem. All right, so it says here at line 16 where that list is first declared, um, does not implement the copy trait. Doesn't really matter for us right now in our example, but we move that. So here it is, move the closure in here and then variable move due to use in closure. So if this was part of the uh, copy trait, it would have copied all the items in that vector and then moved a new vector into the thread. And then here we are trying to use that borrowed value um, after the move. So I don't really want to do that because you're going to get an error. So if you haven't seen my video about borrowing, um, I'd suggest to do that. I'll put a link in the description below. It might help explain some of these issues and these errors that we're coming up with here in our code. All right, so I'm going to come out that line, and then I'm going to run this again. So here it is. There's the before and then the after. Well, I guess the thread. Now, I guess we could try and run this multiple times and see if we ever get them in reverse order. I have a feeling we will not. Yeah, so I'm just going to move on. So now we have an option here of moving captured values out of closures. And we need to talk about these FN traits, or these like function traits. So a closure body can do a couple of these things. It can move a captured value out of the closure. It can mutate the captured value, neither move nor mutate the value, capture nothing from the environment to begin with. So depending on how that closure captures the values, the compiler is actually going to know which of the FN traits it actually implements. So here are the three traits. We have fn once, we have fn mute, and then just plain old fn. So I'm going to read uh, the text that's on the screen right now. But it says uh, fn applies to closures that can be called once. That means they're only being used once. Um, all closures implement this, at least this trait, because all closures can be called. So it makes sense. And it, what it's saying is that this fn once Every single closure implements this one or more. So fn mute means that uh, it doesn't necessarily take the values in the closure and move them out into the environment, um, but it actually might mutate some of the values in the closure. And they can also be called more than once. And then fn refers to closures that don't move captured values out of the body. And they don't mutate the captured values. And they might not capture anything at all. And this one can be called multiple times. So let's look at uh, just a small bit of code about the implementation of something that's an option. So remember, option is either some value or none, none of the value. And here we have this method uh, called unwrap or else. So on line 12, let's first look at the signature. We have a generic being used. This is self, so it's actually uh, a method of option. And then we have f, which stands for the function. So now we have a, a constraint on f that f, f is a, uh, a function once, or just it just can be called once. Um, and it must return t. And t is like something that is uh, being examined. So t could be the string, or uh, an integer that might be there or not, or a full vector that might be there or not. So here we have the implementation. So again, we just do a match on self which is the option, and we would then look for something or nothing. So if we do have something, then we have x, and we just return that. So we don't even use the closure. However, if we have nothing, then we're going to use the closure to like give us some sort of like default value or something else other than anything being there. So there's that function, and it's called no more than once um, anywhere else in the body of the implementation. Here's another example. Um, I have here uh, a list of rectangles. So line 18 is called list, and now it has a bunch of rectangles. 
But now um, we're going to use this built-in method here on a vector, which is called sort by key. So sort by key calls the closure multiple times. And therefore, the closure has fn mute. Now, um, this closure here does not capture anything from its environment. Uh, it only uses r and then r.with. So there's nothing being captured from the outside. It doesn't move anything, and it doesn't mutate any of the values in the closure. But because it's called multiple times, it's at least fn mute. So before we continue, I'm going to turn on the Rust analyzer. I have it installed, but I have it disabled. Uh, we're going to start looking at some of these method signatures here so we can help get some assistance from the built-in documentation. All right, so let's look at uh, sort by key here. So here it is, fn mute, right? And we could read a little bit more about it. But that's how we know it calls it multiple times and how it's been declared and what its usage could actually be. So let's take it a step further. So uh, notice here we have um, some sort of sort operation that we want. So that's going to be just another vector. It's a mutable vector, so we want to push some values onto it or do something with it. Right now it's empty. And uh, then we have a value, which is just some string. Now this closure actually captures both of these. So it captures the sort options, and then it captures value. Now it's trying to push value onto sort options. And what does that actually do? Well, then it, it's no longer owned by the closure, but then trying to be owned by sort operations. Now you can do that once, but because this is an fn mute, and could be called multiple times and will be called multiple times, we can't push and have that value get ownership. So like sort operations can't take ownership of value multiple times. One way you could think about doing this is maybe like cloning. So just take a copy of that string. So again, string doesn't implement the copy like maybe an uh, integer would. That's something that we could do is we could clone them. But I don't know necessarily, this is kind of a, a contrived example. It's just an example of uh, getting an error in there and how to actually read it. So I'm going to reintroduce the error. Let's build this and let's look at the uh, output from the compiler. All right, so here's the issue. It says move occurs because value has type string, which does not implement copy, like it's saying before. So that means sort operations would want to take ownership of the string, which looks like it cannot. So yeah. And then just to prove to you guys that this runs multiple times, I'm going to put something in here. All right, let's see uh, how many times it actually does get called. All right, actually uh, it gets called six times. So it is running more than once. Now here on line uh, 24, I do have some sort of mutable value, and I could do that because this is fn mute, right? And then I'm actually getting a copy of these values and just like assigning a new copy to it all the time because that's how those uh, built-in integers work in Rust. All right, so with this example here, I just wanted to show you um, another method of a vector, and this is a fill with. So let's just try and like make this one happen. Um, what it's saying is that uh, since it's a mutable uh, vector, we'd be able to fill it with something, and uh, it takes a closure. So um, it'll just execute some sort of code and then like put that in. So in this case, let's say we want to fill it with just, um, well, I guess just a, a rectangle of 0, 0. So let's see what that would do. So we'll have to do two pipes. And then I'll just give it something like this. So it immediately returns just a rectangle with a width of 0 and a height of 0. Let's see how this pans out in our build. OK, worked just fine. Now, um, all right, so let's actually move this operation before the print. And then let's just print out list and see what it looks like now. All right, so now the list has actually just been replaced with just a bunch of uh, rectangles of 0, 0. So three of them, because there was three in the array, or three in the vector to begin with. Okay, I hope this uh, clears up some of the syntax with closures and maybe some of the errors that you might get with closures and maybe how to look them up in documentation and figure out um, what are some of the things you can actually do to alleviate the errors that you guys get. So if you have questions, put them in the comments below. Thanks for watching and have a good one.